Let's take a look at what an experimental study looks like. The example article is preparatory power posing affects nonverbal presence and job interview performance. And the first author is uh, Amy Cuddy. This paper is published in Journal of Applied Psychology, which is the number one journal in organizational behavior. And it's also something that psychologists appreciate a lot. And the first question that I want to answer is why do we want to look at experiments, even though experiments are not that common in business research? The reason is that if you understand experimental study, then it makes it a lot easier to understand other studies. So experiment is kind of like the gold standard. That's the simplest possible way of making a causal claim with quantitative data and other more complex quantitative designs try to mimic what experiment does through statistical control. But these experiments are typically simple and this is a good starting point for that reason. The study presents a theory that when a person takes a so-called power pose, which is this kind of like a powerful pose and holds it for a little before a stressful situation, then that will increase their performance. Uh, the, the theory is explained here and they apply this to the context of job interviews. They theorize that the mechanism is not the interview content itself, but how the person who behaves, who, who does the interview behaves in the interview. So it's in the nonverbal communication through which this power pose is supposed to have an effect. This article is very interesting in many ways. And one way why it's interesting is that it is um, one of the two articles discussed in this uh, TED talk by Amy Cuddy, which at least at one point was the most viewed TED talk ever. It is now like 25 million views or something like that. And she tells a very compelling personal story. And if you have the time, it's really worth watching after you watch this or before you watch this video. And um, she made uh, quite a bit of, of money from this finding by, by giving uh, talks, doing consulting on, on how you can use your body to gain confidence. Let's take a look at how this uh, study positions into the different uh, classifications that I've gone through this far. And this is a theory testing study. So <clears throat> they present a theory in the beginning of the paper and then they test it with an experiment. In the paradigms framework, this is a functionalist research. So they assume that the world is objectively real, the same for everybody, and they are not trying to uh, implement any radical changes. In terms of these four uh, typical research designs, this is an experiment. It's an experiment because there is a uh, manipulations and we, they are assigning these subjects into treatment and control. I'll explain the details of the experiment in, in a moment. Then in, uh, quantitative studies are often focused on causality and this takes the first strategy, randomization and treatment for eliminating rival explanations. So what does the study actually do? What they do is that they have a student sample and in the study, they have these student samples sample split into two. Uh, the first half does this power pose. So they do this power pose and they hold it for five minutes while they prepare a job talk. And the control condition is this low power pose. They are holding a pose like that and doing the same. The hypothesis is that these people who perform this power pose are do better in the job talk than these people who does do the low power pose. Here's the details. So this was run with a student sample. They had 61 students and um, they were instructed. They came to the lab one at a time. They were instructed to uh, prepare uh, a five minute talk and uh, they held the pose while they were thinking about the talk. And then after that, they gave a talk and there were two people listening to it who didn't give any feedback and then they were taped. Later on, those videotapes were coded for uh, overall performance and hireability, verbal content and nonverbal presence by two independent coders who were also students. And then they did some kind of statistical analysis called analysis, analysis of variance or ANOVA and tested mediation effects. So they were testing whether the effect of power posing goes through uh, nonverbal presence instead of verbal content by using uh, a series of regression analysis. So this is uh, the two poses. And when you evaluate 
this kind of studies or when you read this kind of studies, the first thing that you need to look at is, is there a difference between the treatment and control group after the treatment? So here the treatment was what kind of pose you held before you, you gave the job talk. Then you gave a job talk, you were coded and those are uh, those codings like ratings were then compared. So they uh, calculated these uh, <clears throat> codings, these uh, average values for the, uh, for the ratings. And we can see in high, perf high performance, there is a higher value in overall performance, higher value in higher ability and then in low power. So we, when we look at and read these experimental studies, the first thing that we need to understand is what is the treatment and what is the control and the second is is there a difference after in, in performance or whatever is the dependent variable after the treatment and typically you find a table like this in experimental studies. Before we look at what these uh, if these differences are larger or not we have to understand is this plot difference between let's say 2.43 and 2 could it occur by chance only? Because if you rate people, then it might just happen that those people who were in the treatment group perform better that, like, because of chance than those who were in the control group. To rule out chance and exp as an explanation, quantitative studies l use what we call p-values. And uh, I'm not explaining the details here, but the idea here is that if this p-value is small for a statistical test, then we say, that there likely is some kind of effect in the data. The cutoff that we have is um, 0.05. If the p-value is less than 0.05, we say that the effect is statistically significant. In other words, chance is an unlikely explanation for the effect. And if it's more than 0.05, for example, 0 0.1, we say that it is non-significant and we conclude that we don't have enough evidence to make the claim that there actually is a difference. But these p-values are statistically significant. So we can see that we can then conclude that there is an effect and we can start interpreting if the effect is large or not. When we look at these values here, let's focus on higher ability. We need to compare 2 against 2.43. And is the difference between 2 and 2.43, uh, is the big difference or not? Well, it's, it's in the decimals. So we might say that that's a small effect. But what we really need to look at this is what is the range of the variable. So uh, the range here is, is from 1, no, uh, to uh, 2 maybe, uh, 3, yes. So on average, these low power posing people were right at, at the maybe. And then high power posing students or power posing students were almost halfway between maybe and yes. So the conclusion here is that by adopting a power pose, you can get your behavior for or your performance from the maybe category halfway to the yes category. And, and that is a pretty substantial effect. If you think about uh, what, what are other things that you could do to, to gain that kind of bump in performance. So this is a very, very substantial effect. Then they also studied something that they called mediation. And the idea of mediation is that the uh, effect of one variable on, on another one goes through a third variable that acts as a mechanism. So they are drawing these diagrams here. And the idea is that power posing affects nonverbal presence and nonverbal presence affects overall performance. And the simplest way then to interpret this uh, kind of figure is to again look at the p-values. We might look at these recursion color efficiencies, but because this is just an intro, I'll just focus on the p-values. Uh, we have two p-values here that are of interest first. Does power posing affect nonverbal presence? And then does nonverbal presence affect overall performance? If both effects exist, then we can say that the, the effect of power posing goes through nonverbal presence to overall performance. We see that the p-values are less than 0.05. We say the result is statistically significant and we conclude that there is a mediation effect. So nonverbal presence is one of the mechanisms through which power posing affects overall performance. Then there's another p-value here, what we will look at. And um, because this effect from power posing to overall performance after we control for nonverbal presence is non-significant. Then we say that we don't have enough evidence to say that power posing would have a direct effect. 
And the overall conclusion is that this is a full mediation so that the power posing affects non-verbal presence and overall performance. And that is an exclusive mechanism. So this is the mechanism through which a power posing affects performance. Okay, so this is an interesting study uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it gained a lot of attention. Then when I present this in live in a class and I ask how many students have heard about power posing, quite a few have and some of them have done it themselves. But there is also something else to this and uh, this study is actually very controversial and you can read about the controversy for example in New York Times. What happened is that because the result was so spectacular, it was a very strong effect from an experimental study and it is very interesting in the sense that it challenged people's many researchers prior ideas of what determines performance because it seems implausible that just taking this kind of power pose would have such a substantial effect. A lot of researchers then tried to replicate this study and most of those studies replications who ran this with bigger samples couldn't find any effects of power posing. And then it turned out that the, how this study was done was according to the current the standards that were in use in research at that time and uh, but then the standards changed we started to understand that certain things that researchers do are not ideal and might compromise research findings. The story continues that the second author of this study then said that after considering all the criticism against this study and after considering what they did in their study, she doesn't believe that the effect is real. And uh, now this is often used as an example of a spectacular study where the effect might not be real. 